Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I am your host, Brian Scott. Today, we're going to go over a lesson from Charles Fillmore in his book, Prosperity, called Overcoming the Thought of Lack. Oftentimes, when I speak with people that are struggling in finding abundance, struggling with money problems, it is coming directly from a deep-seated belief in lack. And believe me, I know because I have suffered from this and still oftentimes find myself with thoughts of lack. There's not enough to go around. I'm not going to have enough money to pay my bills. I'm not going to have enough money to do that thing. This thought is so powerful, it will affect your reality in such a major way. And if you can overcome this thought of lack, then you can change your life. So let's see what Charles Fillmore, the great new thought teacher, has to say about this concept of lack and how to overcome it. Overcoming the thought of lack. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind which, when it was filled, they drew up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but the bad they cast away. The mind of man is like the net, catching every kind of idea. And it is man's privilege and duty under the divine law to separate those that are good from those that are not good. In this process, the currents of unselfish, spiritual love flowing through the soul act as great eliminators, freeing the consciousness of thoughts of hate, lack, and poverty, and giving the substance of spirit free access into the consciousness and affairs. In another parable, Jesus explained the same process as a separation of the sheep from the goats. When this divine current of love and spiritual understanding begins its work, we must make this separation. We put the sheep the good and obedient and profitable thoughts on the right, and we put the goats, the stubborn, selfish, useless thoughts on the left. Each must handle his own thoughts and overcome them by aligning them with the harmony and order of the divine thought. There is an infinite omnipresent wisdom within us that will deal with these thoughts and guide us in making the discrimination between the right and wrong when we trust ourselves fully to its intelligence. We can establish a connection between the conscious mind and the superconscious mind within us by meditation, by silence, and by speaking the word. The superconscious mind within you discriminates among the kinds of food you assimilate, controls your digestion, your breathing, and the beating of your heart. It doeth all things well, and it will help you do this important work of directing you in the thoughts you should hold and the ones you should cast out. As you develop this mind within yourself, you will find that you can gradually turn over more and more of your affairs to its perfect discrimination. Nothing is too great for it to accomplish, nor is anything too trivial for it to handle with perfection and dispatch. This mind of the spirit will guide you in perfect ways, even in the minute details of your life, if you will let it do so, but you must will to do its will and trust it in all your ways. It will lead you unfailingly into health, happiness, and prosperity, as it has done and is doing for thousands if and when you follow it. It is just as necessary that one should let go of old thoughts and conditions after they have served their purpose as it is that one should lay hold of new ideas and create new conditions to meet one's requirements. In fact, we cannot lay hold of the new ideas and make the new conditions until we have made room for them by eliminating the old. If we feel that we cannot part with the goats, we shall have to do with fewer sheep we insist on filling the vessels with bad fish, we shall have to do without the good. We are learning that thoughts are things and occupy space in mind. We cannot have new or better ones in a place already crowded with old, weak, inefficient 
thoughts. A mental house cleaning is even more necessary than a material one, for the without is but a reflection of the within. Clean the inside of the platter where the food is kept as well as the outside that people see taught Jesus. Old thoughts must be denied and the mind cleansed in preparation before the affirmative. Christ consciousness can come in. Our mind and even our body is loaded with error thoughts. Every cell is clothed with thought. Every cell has a mind of its own. By the use of denial, we break through the outer crust, the material thought that has enveloped the cells and get down into the substance and the life within them. Then we make contact with the substance and life which our denials have exposed and by it express the positive, constructive side of the law. When we consistently deny the limitations of the material, we begin to reveal the spiritual law that waits within ourselves to be fulfilled. When this law is revealed to our consciousness, we begin to use it to demonstrate all things that are good. That is the state of consciousness that Jesus had, the Christ consciousness. Every man has a definite work to do in the carrying forward of the divine law of spiritual evolution. The law is set into action by our thinking and is continually supported by our thought as it develops our soul. Within us are the great potentialities of spirit that put into action enable us to be, do, or have anything we will. Science tells us that each of us has enough energy within himself to run a universe. If we knew how to release and control it, we do this releasing by a process of letting go and taking hold, letting go of the old or that which has done its part and is no longer useful, and taking hold of the new ideas and inspirations that come from the superconscious mind. Jesus told Peter that what he should bind in earth would be bound in heaven, and what he should loose in earth would be loosed in heaven. He was not talking about a geographical earth or a definite place in the skies called heaven. He was explaining to Peter the law of mind. The conscious mind is but the negative pull of a very positive realm of thought. That positive realm of thought Jesus called the kingdom of the heavens. It is not a place at all, but it is the free activity of the superconscious mind of man. Whatever we bind or limit in earth, in the conscious mind shall be bound or limited in the ideal or heavenly realm. And whatever we loose and set free in the conscious mind, earth, shall be loosed and set free in the ideal, the heavenly. In other words, whatever you affirm or deny in your conscious mind determines the character of the supermind activities. All power is given unto you both in heaven and in earth through your thought. We must carefully choose what thoughts we are going to loose in the mind and what thoughts we are going to bind, for they will come into manifestation in our affairs. As he, man, thinketh within himself, so is he. And whatsoever a man soweth in the mind, that shall he also reap in the manifestation. We must loose all thoughts of lack and insufficiency in the mind and let them go just as Jesus commanded be done with the wrappings that held Lazarus. Loose him and let him go. Loose all thoughts of lack and lay hold of thoughts of plenty. See the abundance of all good things prepared for you and for all of us from the foundation of the world. We live in a very sea of inexhaustible substance, ready to come into manifestation when molded by our thoughts. Some persons are like fish in the sea, saying, Where is the water? In the presence of spiritual abundance, they cry, Where will I get the money? How will I pay my bills? Will we have food or clothes or the necessities? Plenty is here all around, and when you have opened the eyes of the Spirit in yourself, you will see it and rejoice. We mold omnipresent substance with our mind 
and make from it all the things that our mind conceives. If we conceive lack and poverty, we mold that. If we visualize with a bountiful eye, we mold plenty from the ever-present substance. There is perhaps no step in spiritual unfoldment more important than the one we are taking here. We must learn to let go, to give up, to make room for the things we have prayed for and desired. This is called renunciation or elimination, sacrifice it may even seem to some people. It is simply the giving up and casting away of old thoughts that have put us where we are and putting in their place new ideas that promise to improve our condition. If the new ideas fail to keep this promise, we cast them away in their turn for others, confident that we shall eventually find the right ideas that will bring that which we desire. We always want something better than we have. It is the urge of progress, of development and growth. As children outgrow their clothes, we outgrow our ideals and ambitions, broadening our horizon of life as we advance. There must be a constant elimination of the old to keep pace with this growth. When we cling to the old ideals, we hinder our advance or stop it altogether. Metaphysicians speak of this eliminative work as denial. Denial usually comes first. It sweeps out the debris and makes room for the new tenant that is brought into the mind by the affirmation. It would not be wise to eliminate the old thoughts unless you knew that there were higher and better ones to take their place. But we need not fear this because we know the divine truth that God is the source of all good and that all good things can be ours through the love and grace of Jesus Christ. None of us has attained that supreme place in consciousness where he wholly gives up the material man and lives in the spirit, as Jesus did. But we have a concept of such a life and his example showing that it can be attained. We shall attain it when we escape the mortal. This does not mean that we must die to get free from mortality, for mortality is but a state of consciousness. We die daily and are reborn by the process of eliminating the thought that we are material and replacing it with the truth that we are spiritual. One of the great discoveries of modern science is that every atom in this so-called material universe has within it superabundant life elements. God is life and spirit, and He is in every atom. We release this spiritual life quality by denying the crust of materiality that surrounds the cells and affirming that they are spirit and life. This is the new birth which takes place first as a conception in the mind, followed by an outworking in body and affairs. We all want better financial conditions. Here is the way to obtain them. Deny the old thoughts of lack of money and affirm the new thought of spiritual abundance everywhere manifest. Every lesson of scripture illustrates some phase of mental action and can be applied to each individual life according to the need that is most pressing at the time of its perception. If you do not look for the mental lesson when reading scripture, you get but the mere outer shell of truth. If, however, you have the proper understanding of the characters in the narrative, knowing that they represent ideas in your own mind, we can follow them in their various movements and find the way to solve all problems of your life. This does not mean that a study of the written scriptures will itself solve your problems unless you come into the apprehension of the real scriptures, the Bible of the ages, the book of life within your own consciousness. But a study of the outer symbols as given in the written scriptures can and should lead you into the understanding of the truth of being. In every person, we find the conflicting ideas represented by the children of Israel and the Philistines. They are pitted against each other in a conflict that goes on night and day. We call these warring thoughts truth and error. When we are awakened spiritually, we stand on the side of truth, knowing that truth thoughts are the chosen of the Lord, the children of Israel. But the error thoughts sometimes seem so real and so formidable that we quake and cringe with fear in their presence. We know that truth will eventually prevail, but we put the victory off somewhere in the future and say that the error is so large and strong that we cannot cope with it now. 
we will wait until we have gathered more strength. Then we need stand still and affirm the salvation of the Lord. Ideas are not all of the same importance. Some are large and strong, some are small and weak. These are aggressive, dominating ideas that parade themselves and brag about their power and with threats of disaster keep us frightened into submission to their wicked reign. These domineering ideas of error have one argument that they always use to impress us, that of the fear of results if we should dare to come out and meet them in open opposition. This fear of opposing ideas, even when we know them to be wrong, seems to be woven into our very mental fabric. This fear is symbolized by the spear of Goliath, which, as the story relates, it was like a weaver's beam. What is the most fearful thought in the minds of men today? Is it not the power of money? Is not Mammon the greatest Philistine, the Goliath, in your consciousness? It is the same whether you are siding with the Philistines and are successful in your finances from a material viewpoint or whether you are with the Israelites and tremble in your poverty. The daily appearance of this giant Goliath, the power of money, is something greatly feared. Neither the Philistines nor the Israelites are in possession of the promised land, neither side at peace or happy in any security, so long as this domineering giant parades his strength and shouts his boasts. This error idea claims he is stronger than the Lord of Israel. He must be killed before all other error thoughts will be driven out of your consciousness and you can come into the consciousness of plenty, the promised land of milk and honey. The whole world today trembles before this giant error idea. The belief that money is the ruling power. The nations of the world are under this dominion because men think that money is power. The rich and the poor alike are slaves to the idea. Kings and great men of the earth bow and cringe before the money kings. This is because man has given this power to money by his erroneous thinking. He has made the golden calf and now he falls before it in worship instead of making it his servant. He has called it master and becomes its slave. The rule of this mad giant has been disastrous and the end of it is rapidly approaching. The first step in getting your mind free from this giant bugaboo is to get a clear perception of your right as a child of God. You know that you should put no other gods or powers before the true God. You know also that you should not be under the dominion of anything in the heavens above or the earth beneath, for you have been given dominion over all. You will never find a better time to come into the realization of the truth of who and what you are and what your rights are. Never was a more propitious time to seek a new and better state of consciousness. If you're in fear of the boasting Philistine giant, as so many around you are, begin now to seek a way, as did David, to give his flesh unto the birds of the heavens. There is a way, a righteous way that cannot fail, and it is your duty to find it. Follow each step of the way that is symbolically and beautifully set forth in the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. The name David means the Lord's beloved, and David represents your righteous perception of your privileges as the child of God. You are not a slave to anything or to anybody in the universe. The threat of this Goliath, the power of money, holds no terrors for you in this consciousness. You have a smooth perception of truth and you sling it straight to the center of his carnal thinking, his forehead. The weight of his shield and his armor does not intimidate you, for you see them for what they are, empty and meaningless, show, vulnerable in many places to the true ideas with which you are armed. Even the most ardent defenders of the money power will admit that it is a tyrant and that they would not have it rule their world if they could help it. It nearly always destroys its friends in the end. Any man who becomes a slave to money is eventually crushed by it. On the other side are the whole armies of righteous people, Christians, who, like the army of Israel, think that this giant cannot be overcome. They are waiting for reinforcements, something larger and stronger in a physical way, with which to overcome this enemy. 
they forget that the battle is Jehovah's. Do you cringe before this giant when he comes out to impress you with his boastings and threats? It does not have to be so. You need not continue to fear. There is a little idea in your mind that can slay him. You perhaps have not considered this little idea of much importance. Perhaps you have kept it off on a lonely mountainside of your spiritual consciousness, herding the sheep which are your innocent thoughts. Now let this David come forth, this perception of your rightful place in divine mind. Get a clear idea of where you really belong in creation and what your privileges are. Do you think for a moment that God has so ordained that men cannot escape from the terrible servitude of hard conditions? Of course not. That would be injustice, and God is above all just. It is your privilege to step out at any time and accept the challenge of this boaster. The Lord has been with you in the slaying of the fear of sin and sickness, the bear and the lion, and he will still be with you in slaying the fear of poverty, which Goliath symbolizes. The battle is Jehovah's, and he is with us to deliver us out of the hand of the Philistines. The weapons of the Lord's man are not carnal. He does not wage war after the manner of the world. He does not use armor of steel or brass, the protection of selfishness, and the weapons of oppression. He goes forth in the simplicity of justice, knowing that his innocence is his defense. He uses only his shepherd's sling and smooth stones words of truth. This is the will and the words of the truth that sends forth. They are disdained by the Philistines and many people laugh at the idea of using words to overcome conditions, but words do their work. The work whereto they are sent and the great mass of materiality goes down before their sure aim. We know that money was made for man and not man for money. No man needs to be a slave to his brother man or cringe before him to obtain money which is the servant of all alike we are not bound to the wheel of work of ceaseless toil day after day in order to appease the god of mammon on his own terms we are children of the living god who as a loving father is right here in our midst where we may claim him as our support and our resource on such conditions as he lovingly reveals when we have acknowledged him and denied Mammon. This day has Jehovah delivered this proud Philistine into our hands, and the victory is ours. Praise God. The five smooth stones chosen by David from the book represent five irrefutable statements of truth. These statements sent forth from a mind confident of itself, its cause and its spiritual strength will crush the forehead of Goliath's error giant. The statements are the following. I am the beloved of the Lord. He is with me in all my righteous words, and they do accomplish that whereto I send them forth. My cause is just, for it is my divine right to be supplied with all things whatsoever that the Father has placed at the disposal of his children. I dissolve in my own mind and the minds of all others any thought that my own can be withheld from me. What is mine comes to me by the sure law of God, and in my clear perception of truth I welcome it. I am not fearful of poverty. I am under obligations to no one. My opulent Father has poured out to me all resources, and I am a mighty channel of abundance. I selfishly own nothing, yet all things in existence are mine to use and in divine wisdom to bestow upon others. Do not hold yourself in poverty by the fear of lack and by practicing a pinching economy. If you believe that all that the Father has is yours, then there is surely no reason for skimping. Nothing will so broaden your mind and your world as the realization that all is yours. When you realize the boundlessness of your spiritual inheritance, nothing shall be lacking in all your world. See with the bountiful eye, for he that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed. This passage states an exact law, the law of increase. Religious leaders in the past have spread the belief that it is a Christian duty to be poor and that poverty is a virtue. This is by no means the doctrine of Jesus. He accepted the proposition fully without reservation or qualification that God is our resource 
and that the father has provided all things for his children, he is often described as being poor, without a place to lay his head. Yet, he had a parental home at Nazareth and was welcomed gladly into the homes of both the rich and the poor all over Palestine. He dressed as a rabbi, and his clothing was so rich and valuable that the Roman soldiers coveted the seamless robe. He wore and cast lots for it. He found abundance in the kingdom of God, where everything needful becomes manifest, not through hard labor, but through the realization of truth. Jesus seldom had need for money because he went back of money to the idea it represents and dealt with money in the idea realm. Our government is back of all our paper dollars, else they would have no value. God is back of our every material symbol, and it is in God rather than in the symbol that we should put our faith. He is back of our call for food and raiment and everything that we could need or desire. Jesus says, all we need to do is ask in faith and in his name. Believe that we receive and we shall have. And we should not hesitate to ask largely, for God can give much as easily as he can give little. So it's a simple lesson. And to kind of break it down a little bit, there's two aspects that he's saying that you need to do to simplify it from all of the biblical discussion that he is giving. First of all is denials. You need to deny the idea that you are going to be poor, that there's not opportunities and resources available to you that will give you abundance. If you are fearful that you're going to run out of money, fearful that there won't be a job for you, fearful that there's not enough resources available for you, the first step is to deny it. Those thoughts are sitting in your mind. So he kind of gives the idea that it's like, imagine a room and it's just full of all this furniture, right? You need to get rid of some of that terrible furniture before you can put new stuff in. So you need to be aware of this new abundance thought that you have, but begin to deny the ones that the the fear thoughts. So there's a two-step process here. You want to deny the idea that there is a lack. So when you have lack thoughts come up, I'm not going to be able to do this. There's not going to be enough money. There's not going to be enough jobs. I won't be able to get that loan. I won't be able to do this. I'm not going to get paid enough. When you have those thoughts come up and they will come up, you need to deny them. This is not true. I am, I am wealthy. I am happy. So you do two parts of it. First is denial. You deny that thought. You say that it's wrong. You proclaim that it's wrong in your mind with your words. Now he says the word is another aspect of this. So he's talking about affirmations and prayer. So then you then embrace the idea of the opposite of lack with affirmations. My favorite go-to affirmation is the meditation that I recommend. Large sums of money come to me easily and quickly in increasing quantities from multiple sources on a continuous basis in the best interest of all that I get to keep and spend and use joyfully. You can change it however you want. You should go through your life and really question your overall belief system. If you believe the only way that you can overcome lack is by breaking the law, then you need to change that and deny that thought. If you believe that receiving money takes a long time and it's hard you need to deny that thought you need to say it's easy if you believe that you can receive money but in only in small amounts you need to deny that thought that large sums of money can come to you you believe that it's difficult and hard you got to work hard you need to deny that thought money comes to me easily if you believe it takes a long time that you start now it's going to take me a year to get this money then you need to deny that thought you need to deny that the money will come to me quickly if you believe that receiving money hurts other people this is the key to the lack thought that you need to overcome the idea that when you receive money somebody else has to lose it there's more than enough money to go around this is a deep-seated subconscious thought and you got to overcome this idea because there may be a part of you that says, hey, I don't need to make money because other people need money. And you have a caring part of your heart that wants other people to be prosperous and abundant. And you may have a deep subconscious part of you that believes that when you make money, somebody else will lose it. It's not how it works. And I see it all the time. Somebody says, my business is competitive. I need to destroy that business. I've seen it also on YouTube. My channel's competitive. I need to destroy that channel. I've seen it in so many other businesses and things. Everybody can be prosperous at the same time. There's more than enough to go around. You're going to reach a point 
and I definitely recommend the Wells of Abundance episode, which is a book on the seven planes of supply. You need to look around you when you are walking in the forest or anywhere, looking at the mountains, all of it is yours. The air that you're breathing is yours by divine right. The water you drink, all of this, and start to really become aware of how much abundance you have all around you. There is no lack. Go and look in the universe. The universe is filled with billions and billions of galaxies and stars all around. And each of those is built with an abundance of resources. The universe is a model for your universe in your life. And so when you look out into the stars, you can see the abundance. Just dwell on that thought. The never-ending infinite abundance of the universe is God in action. And everything in life and nature on a large scale always ends up on a small scale. It's the Fibonacci sequence. It's everything is reflected in the big is reflected in the small. And so when you look out into the universe, the universe is so abundant, never ending resources, never ending. There is no lack. So within your life, there is no lack. So create those statements. He gives some that are pretty good here. I'm the beloved of the Lord. He is with me in all my righteous words, and they do accomplish that word too. I send them forth. My cause is just, for it is my divine right to be supplied with all things whatsoever the Father has placed at the disposal of his children. You will have a certain physical heart response to certain words. So start writing down different affirmations until you find something that is so perfect for you and then embrace it. I've read some stories about people that have won lotteries, that have had huge miracles happen financially, that had certain affirmations. I will steal those affirmations and start experimenting and using them and saying them out loud all the time. My affirmation comes from a combination of a number of affirmations. And, and my own belief is that you have a specific affirmation that will light you up. And whenever you have these fear, fear thoughts, deny the fear and then start adding in a positive thought. So the two-step process is create the vacuum and then fill the vacuum with the positive thought and be relentless with this because every thought, every single thought has power. Every single thought is a creational act and one single moment, second of time, a creational act can create a baby. And same as your thought, one single thought can create a lack situation in your life. So find those thoughts. Don't let them just float through deny them don't let them take hold take root imagine that your mind is a garden and if a seed of lack is dropped into the soil dig it up and throw it out that's all you got to do for those of you that come from a more biblical perspective the story here is great the power of money is this fear thought that destroys us or builds us up and it is the Goliath that he talks about and it is a metaphor there is this Goliath and you can overcome this your life can be destroyed by toiling away working 12 hours a day in a terrible job barely making ends meet okay and believing that you can't get a better job that you can't find a resource that gives you the money that belief is the the thought of lack that is destroying your life. If you've been in a job for 30 years, well, it's too late now. Never going to do it. Not going to have enough. Not true. Everything is possible. All things are possible. You have the ability to create a prosperous world around you efficiently, quickly, and easily right now. And don't ask the how question. The how question is a lack question. Oh, I don't know how that's going to happen. That's not going to work. I don't see how it's worked in my whole life. It's never worked. I've never been able to get that money. I don't see how that can happen. You start asking those questions, deny the how, deny the how the how is taken care of the infinite intelligence of the universe is so amazing that things will happen that you never could have conceived of opportunities will come into your life. When you have the lack thought, 
what's happening is you might have been through a process. You meditate for 20 minutes. You really start to embrace abundance. And then you go out and have the lack thought for 20 hours a day, right? And then you're, you're, 20 minute meditation might have had an effect. You might have put out and projected some powerful, abundant thoughts. You'll have opportunities that start to come to you because you're thinking lack thoughts for the rest of the day. When they come to you, you walk right by them. An opportunity comes, a new business idea comes. Hey, you need to buy that lottery ticket. Whatever it is, you might find something in your house. You're not aware that it's worth thousands of dollars. There are opportunities coming to you all the time. Embrace them. Okay, embrace the small as well as the large. If you find a penny on the street, then embrace it. That is part of this wonderful abundance. And when you embrace all the supplies and flow, the larger ones will come to you. Okay, I know you're out there. I know you're struggling. We're in an economy that is having a pretty hard time right now. And you can look at that and say, oh, because of the COVID, because of the economy, it's going to be bad for me now. There's just not enough resources now. Not enough people are working. I can't do it. No, no, no. It's not true. You have the power within your heart to create any reality that you want. It is a reality revolution. And don't let that lack thought enter in and dig in and start to sprout within your garden. Now you need to release it. So continually on a regular basis, clean out your garden and plant beautiful thoughts of abundance and prosperity and your life will change. I promise. So let me know what you're doing right now to overcome those lack thoughts, because I promise you, even Jeff Bezos has those lack thoughts. He's created a system to overcome it, but everybody in the world has them. And some people automatically overcome them because of their environment, their situation. Some people are in a much worse situation, but you need to overcome it. It is more important than anything else if you want to live a prosperous life. In any case, all episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com. And welcome to The Reality Revolution.